Hello and welcome. Comic books have a unique language that has developed over many decades. So techniques that are common today have evolved from years of prior trial and error. However, the basics have always been the same. A comic book page is broken down into four key elements. The panel, the lettering, which represents the actual script, the gutter, and the artwork. To be clear, a page doesn't need to contain all four elements to be considered a comic book page. For example, some panels can take up an entire page and there's no gutter present. Or, a panel or series of panels can lack any lettering. And in some rare cases, a panel can be devoid of any artwork and contain minimal or no lettering. So these elements are used in conjunction with one another to produce a comic book page. For the most part, these are the invisible portions of a page, or the mechanical bits that we don't pay attention to when reading. But when it comes to analysis, interpretation, or trying to figure out why something works, all these little pieces have to be considered. Because they all work in tandem to make reading a comic an enjoyable, organic experience. While art is, ultimately, subjective, craft is not. And that's what this video essay looks at. The craft. Craft is why an artist, such as Jack Kirby, gets high praise. Even if one looks at some of his less successful works, the basic or intuitive level of craft is astounding. This video essay and the forthcoming parts are an attempt to analyze these elements in depth. And to be completely forthright, I have zero qualifications in this medium. I have no training or special knowledge to justify my conclusions or analysis. I'm simply an average geek who's read a lot of comics. That's all. But I do get asked what I take into account when writing a review. Sometimes I get approached by new talent looking for advice to improve. This series will address those questions. So look at this as my guide for reviewers, talent, and those curious about the method of evaluation your humble narrator uses. This is my Rosetta Stone. It might not be yours, but feel free to glean and utilize whatever insight you can. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's look at the basics of a comic page. Ideally, each page should contain a beginning, middle, and end. However, this is a more modern technique and mainly used by those that adhere to formalism. For those that aren't familiar with that term, formalism is the critical position that the most important aspect of a work of art is its form the way it's made, and its purely visual aspects, rather than its narrative content or its relationship to the visible world. That definition is specific to works of art, but it also applies to literature as well. For example, a novel's grammar or the rhythm of words would be formalism. To use a popular example, Shakespeare's use of iambic pentameter would be formalism. The nine-panel grid is the most obvious use of this technique. Within the three rows of three panels, the first row is the beginning, the second is the middle, and the final row is the end. This breaks down even further. Within each row, the first panel is the beginning, the second is the middle, and the final panel is the end. This structure can also apply to pages with any type of recurring grid. Although, generally speaking, with grids that aren't nine panels, the beginning and the end are the first and last panels, respectively, and the remaining panels are the middle. Again, this isn't a hard rule. Regardless of whether there's three or nine or 15 panels, the final panel should land on an action that engages the reader enough to get them to turn the page. Usually, that is something unresolved. As an example, that action can be a hero getting punched and knocked backwards. We turn the page to see if they've been knocked out or whether they've recovered. Or perhaps the page ends on a question that needs an answer. In the same vein, it can be an engaging emotional beat, where the potential response or reaction continues on the next page. The action in question doesn't need to be resolved on the following page. It merely has to engage the reader enough to get them to turn the page. In fact, the next page can be a completely different scene, and that dangling resolution motivates us to continue forward. Again, ideally, the final panel on each page is a mini cliffhanger that elicits the subconscious response to continue further. This isn't always the case. It's a general guideline, though. Really, there are only two types of pages. There's the regular story page, as just discussed, and the splash page. The splash page has a few variations. It can be one image taking up an entire page, or one image taking up two pages. On a rare occasion, a splash page can include three or more pages, as seen in Mage. 
The common element is one image, usually a dramatic action scene, that the reader takes in all at once. The other variation is a splash page that doubles as a title page. Jack Kirby commonly did a two-page spread with the story title. Classically, The Spirit by Will Eisner and others incorporated the title into a splash page. To get really super technical, the image space on the original artwork all happens within a 10 by 15 inch area. Anything outside that area is known as the bleed. The bleed itself is a half inch space around the image area. During the reproduction process, the artwork is shrunk down and anything just outside the bleed is liable to be cut off once the pages are printed and trimmed to the standard comic book size. For those familiar with the authority, the bleed, or the space between universes, was a reference to this area of the comic book page. Personally, I don't consider the bleed an element of the page. It's a technical restraint, like the active image area. For pseudo-intellectuals like myself, each page depicts a certain amount of time. The exact amount of time each page represents is relative to the reader. It has to be relative, because there is no way to objectively measure how much time each page represents. Let me justify that statement. In movies, we know a second has passed because 24 frames have been shown. For most video games, the same amount of time is represented by 60 frames. In music, we know time has passed because a musical composition has a certain amount of beats per minute. So with these three examples, we can objectively quantify the passage of time. With that in mind, what is the measurement of time in a comic book? In the end, the answer relies on the relative perception and experience of the reader. Unless the text on the page is very specific, there is no right or wrong answer regarding the precise amount of time each page represents. All one can accurately state is that each panel represents a portion of time that contributes to the accumulation of time each page represents. Thank you for watching. I should acknowledge two well-known works that influenced this video. Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud and Comics and Sequential Art by Will Eisner. While it's been a few decades since I read either and I didn't reference them while writing this script, it's undeniable that both pieces had an effect on my perception of comics as a medium, as did numerous uncountable interviews with various creators I've read during my lifetime. My views, opinions, and general perception has been shaped by many others. This is the first introductory part in what could end up being a four-part series. The second part will deal with the panel, the lettering, and the gutter. The third part is a dedicated look at artwork. And the final portion will be my method of analyzing a story using all the elements discussed in the prior three parts. The idea for this came from one of my Discord moderators, Secret Comics Cabal, who suggested I do a live comic book lecture type of thing. If you've ever watched a live stream, you know I'm reasonably incoherent when not working from a script. So, instead of a roundtable discussion with Discord members, I opted to take the idea and make it far more cohesive. So here we are. Naturally, likes, comments, and all that engagement stuff determine whether this is a series I should continue, or whether this is the pretentious meanderings of yet another geek who thinks they know what they're talking about. I leave it entirely in your hands. Thanks to all my fine supporters on Patreon and YouTube. Your ongoing support makes it possible for this channel to continue. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so very, very much. Extra special thanks to Salmonella13, Eidolon, Constant Disappointment Records, Jeff Nicholson, Sicken, Francis De La Cruz, Chris Malloy, Michael DeFonte, John Nyux, Andrew Barton, Odin Ashcroft, Ruby St. Dennis, Phil Sagan, Edward Clayton Andrews, Corey Drew, L.S. Gregor, Brian Deaton, Tom Granis, James Graham, and Matt Marino. You are all justified and ancient. Until next time.